epistle of the Apostle Peter, 2 Peter. We'll be looking at chapter 1. So, uh, read some verses and try to just uh, encourage you tonight with some practical stuff tonight. We're going to talk about just some practical stuff. Uh, it's, uh, I think just some stuff that'll help you in a practical manner and to live with uh, a life of godliness. And that's what this uh, first chapter in 2 Peter is really all about. So again, uh, also, I, let me, before I forget, thank all you ladies that helped uh, cook and, and for Mr. Doby down there. And, you know, and uh, boy, just thank y'all for that and, and arranging that and everything. They really appreciate it. And uh, boy, they really enjoyed that. And I thought that was a comfort to them. So thank you for doing that, all you ladies that did that. And, you know, I didn't see any men help with that, but if you did, I thank you too. But were there any men to... I seen Sean back there when he tested him. He was just making sure, right? Gotcha. Okay. All right. Second Peter. Let me read these verses. Uh, I'll read. Uh, let me read four, the first fourteen verses, and um, and then we'll just uh, give you some thoughts on this, and uh, hope this will help you. Now, Second Peter, uh, chapter one. The Word of God tells us, uh, Simon Peter a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. You notice uh, we've already seen that word knowledge twice in verse 2 and 3. And we'll talk about that some. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And what's he talking about there? He's talking about the Word of God. His exceeding and great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust and besides this giving all diligence add to your faith and now he's not saying that you don't you need something more than faith to be saved but what he's given us here is a checklist uh, if you would um, uh, for lack of a better word on uh, some things that you'll have in your life the things that you need to seek diligently to have in your life to uh, to assure yourself that you're growing in the Lord and that you're living a life of godliness. And so I want to give you, I want to give you the, this checklist. He's going to give us this checklist and we're going to talk about it because you need to say, you know, am I in the will of God? Am I living God? And, and, and am I being all that I can be for God? And he, then he gives us this checklist. Now he told us that we can all, we have all the, what, that we need to have these things, but do we have these things in our life? And then he begins to say this. He says, uh, add to your faith, or put into your faith uh, virtue, okay, and virtue knowledge. Now this word knowledge here is a different word than the first knowledge we, we looked at. There's two knowledges that we saw in, in the word in verse 2 and 3, and then we have the word knowledge here, which is, is a different knowledge, and we'll talk about that, but I think it's important. And to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, uh, godliness, okay? And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. And of course, we know that's love. That's King James always uh, translates that many times. Anyway, the word charity, because the charity is really the right translation for it. I think uh, the translators did a great job in using that word instead of love, because uh, charity has the idea of charity is doing something. Charity is a verb. Uh, listen, love, if love is just a feeling, that's not the love that this is. This is not a filial love. It's not uh, just puppy love. You know, it's not like the, the love Jamie had when she first laid eyes on this. <laughs> it's, it's the love she has now after she's seen what I really am. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, the, the, it's, you know what I mean. It's more off, you know what I mean? And the real love, then you need the real love, right? Everybody agree with that? Yeah. You better have the real thing. Okay, uh, if you're gonna uh, have that uh, vow and that covenant between each other. So anyway, let me go on for it. Good. I don't know how I got on that. For if these things be in you and abound, now abounding is talking about growing there. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But he that lacketh these things, he's blind, and he cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence uh, to make your calling and election sure. Now, don't be, listen, people get all worked up about those two words, calling and election. Uh, the calling is simple. Jesus said, come unto me. Amen. That's pretty simple, ain't it? And you don't have to be a doctor to understand that. And Jesus said, come unto me. There back in Matthew, uh, he says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. And he says, listen, I'll give you rest. And the call is, it's that simple. It's nothing hard. You don't have to read too much into that. Election is sure. Listen, election, that's easy. I can give you the definition of election. Election is, is it's not God's will that any man should perish, Amen. but that all come to a saving knowledge of Him through repentance. That's the election. That's the calling. Guess what? It is a whosoever calling Amen. and a whosoever election. Okay? Amen. So when you see those words in Scripture, you don't have to worry about, you know, yes, it's a whosoever. Any man, whosoever, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be Say it is God's will. Listen to me. It's God's will that every person be saved. Amen. Will every person be saved? No, of course not. Uh, I don't. Do you know who's going to be saved? And who does? No. Does God? Sure, He does. If He didn't, He wouldn't be God. But that's listen. God's got His little thing over here, and you're not in it. Yeah. <laughs> so stop worrying about it. Stop thinking about it. God loves you and wants you to be saved okay and so don't worry about those words calling election predestination listen predestination is the most misinterpreted word in the bible predestination is not predetermination okay when that's the that's the confusion predetermination is not the same word as predestination you are destined to reign with him that's his will Predetermination is something all the difference. Do you see the difference in that? Predetermination is that God made you and He either made you for heaven or hell. Okay? That's pre in other words, before you were ever made, when you were a thought of God, He said, I predetermined that this one goes to hell. I predetermined that this one goes to heaven. Now that's not the God of the Bible. Okay? The God of the Bible loves you with an everlasting love. And that hell was not made for you. That's right. Hell, the Bible says hell was made for the angels that were falling from heaven. That's right. But man sinned, okay? And so man sinned. He, he's, he got in rebellion with God. And so God had to remedy the problem. And he said, you know what? I'm going to remedy it from the foundation of the world with the lamb that was slain. My son Jesus Christ is going to shed his blood. And by faith, those who accept it are going to experience my grace and forgiveness. And that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's always been His plan to save man. Amen. Uh, listen, He had mercy on me. Listen, when, uh, think of it this way. This, man, I'm chasing rabbits tonight, but I want to explain this to you. God, after Adam sinned, we think that God punished Adam when He threw him out of the Garden of Eden. Right? He threw him out of the Garden of Eden. That was because he had mercy on Adam. He said, listen, if I let him in there and he eats of the tree of what? Life, he'll live forever in his sinful state. There's no help for him. But he said, I'm going to take and push him out so that I can redeem him so he doesn't have to live forever in sin, that I will have the chance to shed my blood for him. I will robe myself in flesh. And as God, I will step out of glory. And, and Christ, had, he had this mind in him, right? He took on, taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but took on the form of a servant and made himself of no reputation and come down here to save us. And so uh, those are big words. Um, I just thought a lot of times people ask me about that and I just got on a rabbit trail. But let's move on. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Well, that's a great promise, ain't it? It doesn't say you might fall sometime. It says you shall never fall if you do these things. For so an entrance shall be administered unto you abundantly unto the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. Now, he said, look, I know you know these things, but Paul, uh, Peter, James, all these guys, and Jesus, all these guys used a form of 
of instruction that's very uh, that works well, and it's called repetition. Okay, he said, man, I get tired of hearing that preacher preach that same old message. Listen, uh, the story used to go that D.L. Moody was a great preacher from the past, and he would only preach. Uh, he only had about a dozen messages that he liked to preach. Now, he, of course, he preached thousands of different messages, but people would get on him because he kept repeating the same old things. And so, uh, <clears throat> D.L. Moody knew the secret that, listen, if it worked once, it'll work again. Okay, and so repetition helps us with that. It establishes, it puts the emphasis where the emphasis is. And so he says, I know you know these things, but I want, I want, you to, I want this stuff to be in your remembrance. And in verse 13, he says, yeah, I think it meant as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in, there's the word again, remembrance. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus has showed me, moreover I will endeavor that you be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. In fact, that's three times in those verses that we just read, he used the same word remembrance. Even in <coughs> chapter 3 and verse 1, he uses the same uh, phrase in here. He says, uh, Beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure, pure mind by way of remembrance. And so Paul, Peter said, Listen, I'm fixing to leave this world. And it's really important to me that I leave something behind. Is that important to you? That you leave something behind? And the, the greatest thing he could leave behind then is this thing about godliness. It's this thing about, uh, he goes on to, later in these chapters to talk about false teachers and apostasy and things like that. And he says, I want you to be put into remembrance the Word of God. Now let's go back. We've read our verses. Well, notice what it says in verse 1 again. I want you to mark that phrase there. He says, he's writing to these Christians here and he says, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Like precious faith. That's an amazing verse when you really think about it because what he's saying is, listen, your faith is just like my faith. Now we're talking about a man that walked on water. Now he might have sunk down in the water, but he did walk on the water. That's more than most of us can say. Most of us wouldn't even got out the boat in the storm, right? And so he's saying, every bit of faith that I had, uh, you have. In fact, he said, we're of the family of God. We're of the family of like precious faith. Now think about that. Think about all the men in the, like chapter 11 of Hebrews who has the Hall of Fame of Faith, and they had all this great faith, and we think about them, and they did have great faith, and we think about Abraham and Noah and all that. But he said, listen, you have like precious faith. In other words, he's saying, uh, everything that was available to these men or is available to you. Think about that. Well, I can never be Abraham, really. That's not what God said. I, I can never do what this person done in faith. No, that's not what God said. That's not what the Word of God said. He said it's like precious faith. You know, Peter loves the word precious. And he used it to talk about the faith. He used the word precious. And if you turn back over into the first, uh, uh, there, the first uh, uh, letter that he wrote, he uses precious uh, all the time in his writings. Uh, in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, he says, To whom coming as unto a light, living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God. And he's speaking of Jesus, and he says, Chosen of God, and what? And precious. He loves that word precious. He goes on to talk about the, um, Unto you therefore which believe, he is, a he is precious. And he uses that word to describe Jesus Christ, but now he uses that word to describe our faith in Jesus Christ and what we have available to us as the family of God. And then he goes on to say, Grace and peace be multiplied to you. And you notice if you ever check the Bible out, that order always stays the same. It's always grace and then peace. Why? Because you can't have peace before grace. Right. You have peace after grace. And that's why the order is like it is. And notice we talked about in verse 2 and 3, he said knowledge. He used that word knowledge in verse 2 and verse 3. And he said the life of godliness. Now listen. Uh, grace and peace, life and godliness, all these things are through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. In other words, this word knowledge is, uh, is the word epigenosis. In other words, that word is not important, but the meaning of it is important because it means super knowledge. It means to be fully acquainted with 
the Word of God. Are you fully acquainted with the Word of God? I mean, think about it. I, I was talking to, I believe it was you, Henry, this morning. Uh, if you read Matthew Henry's commentary, anybody ever heard of Matthew Henry? And he's got this big, long commentary. It's like volumes. It's this thick. I got one in my office. And he said that, so, I think Spurgeon said that he read through that commentary four times. Four times. I mean, it's, it's, that's an exhaustive commentary. But you'd see when they commentate on something, and this was written back in the 1400s, and uh, Matthew Henry might say, he might say, well, this word is found 1,200 times in the Bible. You know how he knows that? Because he read through the Bible and found that word 1,200 times. You know what I do to find 1,200 times? <laughs> Click on my map. <laughs> and I do a word search. And it tells me uh, how many times a word is. If I need the definition of something, I click. Listen, God, listen, I'm not saying, listen, what I'm saying is it's never been a time that the study of the Bible was made more easier than it is right now. Right. If we don't know the Bible the way we should and have that perfect knowledge and are not acquainted with the Scriptures, it's simply because we don't want to be. Okay? Because listen, when I first started, and many of you folks out there that studied the Bible for years, remember when you had to carry around the, the lexicon and the, the Strong's Concordance? And you go through that thing and find your words and stuff. And now, I mean, it's so readily, of the, the study in the Scripture is so readily available to us. And to know and the knowledge of it and the way we should, listen, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves that we live in, I think, a time where Bible ignorance is, is, is rampant. Yeah. It's just rampant. I mean, it's hard to find somebody. You can testify to this. It's hard to find somebody to have an intelligent conversation with about spiritual things from Scripture. I mean, really. And, and listen, I know we're all on different stages. Uh, we're on milk, uh, you know, a little bit more than milk. Some of us are on, uh, you know, steak, meat, whatever. I know that everybody's different in their life. But what he's saying here, and we'll find out as we read this, that we ought to be abounding. In other words, we ought to be growing. Peter said, listen, I am an apostle. Listen. I was with Jesus. Arguably, I am the best friend that Jesus had on the face of the earth. And I need to abound and grow in the Lord. If He needs to grow in the Lord, what does that say about me? And we can abound in the Lord only through the knowledge of Him. This is how you grow, friend. This is the food. This is the meat. I, I like, listen, I like to tell you it's an easier way, but it's more perspiration than inspiration. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, Dr. Clarence Sexton used to say that all the time. He said, fellas, it's more, it's a, it takes perspiration as much as it does inspiration. You know what he was saying? He said, look, you don't want to work to understand and know the Bible. You've got to open this. You're never going to study the Bible by accident. That's right. You're never going to pray by accident. It's got to be a deliberate purpose and exercise in your life. And Peter said, this knowledge is, is a super knowledge. It's epigenosis. It is a practical working knowledge of the Bible. Jesus put it like this. And maybe this is what Peter was thinking when he wrote this by the uh, moving of the Holy Spirit, moving his pen. But you remember when Peter got his feet washed? Remember that? He didn't really understand what Jesus was doing. Jesus took off the mm, Have mercy. I like to preach that right now. He just took off his robe of glory. And he got, can you imagine? The King of Kings got down on his knees and washed those dirty feet of those disciples. And that was a picture of him, how dirty it was for him to leave glory and take, and take off the robe of glory and, and robe himself in flesh. And that was what that picture was. But getting back to this, maybe this is what Peter was thinking because remember when Jesus said, Happy are ye if you know these things and what? And do them. And if Jesus was saying, Listen, guy, there's a whole big difference between knowing and doing. Listen, this, this knowledge has got to be a practical, working knowledge of the Scriptures. We study, we put in, ah, we eat. Listen, just like that, that's the illustration. And listen, we take that and it works itself out. The Word of God works itself out in our life. If we're to bound, if we're to grow, listen, you know what happens when you stop growing? The decaying process starts. Right. You know, it's, listen, I stopped growing. I grew to about 18, I guess. And then I joined the service, and I remember 
when I got about 20, my feet grew, which was an odd thing. But they say now that a man can grow up to maybe 21, he's still growing a little bit. And now I'm still growing, but it's, it's horizontal, it's not vertical. <laughs> you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I do too. You know what I mean, don't you? But listen, when I, listen, once I stopped growing, you know what I started doing? Regressing. Did you know I'm not as tall as I was when I was 20? That's, that's frightening. Isn't it? Now I still tell everybody I'm about 6, 6'1. Six, but I'm shrinking. Did you know you shrink when you get older? And if some guy's got a band like Mickey, he, he can shrink a lot. He's still be tall and playing with him. So, you know, but, you know, you start the decaying process. You, you look at, hey, that's the same way. Listen, if I don't, yeah, once I stop growing, I started decaying. Man, I, this is some wrinkles, man. We had a picture the other day. She had it out. I was up in West Virginia, one of the church we planted today. I don't know if Dave was, had went yet or not. It was one of the early pictures where Ray was there Saturday. And man, I guess it was 10, 11 years ago. What happened to me? I was just been a decade. But I stopped growing. And now I'm decaying. Sorry. I know that's bad news for you young folks. Trust me. That's what happens. And same way in your Christian life. When you stop growing, you cease to be, listen, you cease to, you start decaying. If you're standing still, listen, uh, you're backslidden. Right. Yes, and that's what's going on here. Paul said, listen, if you want to bang, he said, you need a practical working knowledge of the Word of God. He said, whereby we're given unto us the exceeding great and precious promises that we might have the divine that partakers up it. Listen, get up to the table and feast on His divine nature because Christ in me, the hope of glory. Listen, that divine nature comes out in me when I'm in when I'm when I'm when my prayer life's right, when my study life's right. More of that divine nature comes out in me. Yeah. It's just a, you know what? When I'm disobedient, I'm not too divine. <laughs> When I'm disobedient, you know what he's talking about, divine nature? He's talking about Christ likeness. And listen, when, the more I'm praying, the more I'm studying, the more I'm coming to church, uh, the more I'm soul winning, uh, the, the more that happens in my life, the more like Christ I am. And so that's what he's saying here this practical working knowledge of the precious promises of God working out in me. Okay. Now, here's a checklist. You want to know if you're growing? Okay. Get your pen out. Get your pencil out. Get your paper out. Here's a checklist that he gives us. He said, here's some good evidence if you're abounding, if you're growing in the Lord. He said, first of all, he said, are you virtuous? Are you virtuous? Now, we don't see that word that much more because there's not much virtue left in the world. Uh, but these are all characteristics, really, of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And virtue is moral excellence. Actually, the Strong's Concordance, speaking of that concordance, when you look at the word virtue, the first definition it gives is manliness. That's totally opposite of how the world sees manliness now. Uh, what happened to a gentleman, okay? Well, what happened to a man keeping his word? What happened to a man having some standards? Uh, as he lives this life, godly standards, and he said, listen, uh, you ought to live with a moral excellency in your life. You ought to be a man's man. You ought to be a gentle man. You ought to, you ought to have moral excellence in your life. He said, you have virtue in your life. Another, another definition of virtue is valor. If that helps you, son. Do you have that in your life? And then he says, listen, uh, add the virtue knowledge. Now, knowledge here is a different word than the epigenosis, the two knowledges we looked at in verses 2 and 3. Uh, this is a different knowledge. This has to do with insight. This, happens to, this has to do with uh, the knowledge that you have discernment. Does everybody know what discernment means? Because a few people have discernment anymore. In other words, can you look at a situation... And can you uh, rightly judge and discern what's going on in that situation? 
Do you have discernment when uh, there's things that come in your life? In other words, uh, can you tell, listen, is that a bad thing or a good thing in my life? Should I be involved in that or should I not be involved in that? Is that going to bring me near to Christ or is that taking me away from Christ? Do I have discernment? Uh, listen, you know what? It's kind of like, uh, listen, I don't want to say this out loud, but it's kind of like judging something. Now, I know y'all, you know that if you listen to the old boy out on the street uh, that don't know the Lord, uh, he'll tell you the two verses in the Bible. I've told you the two most famous verses in the Bible, right? That Jesus turned the, the water into wine. Everybody knows that. And it, don't, hey, don't you judge me. <laughs> That's how some of you girls is like, don't you judge me, sister. And they're right, Rachel. Don't you judge me. We're bring you. Listen, if you ain't got judgment, you know what the Bible calls you a fool. Yeah. You better have some judgment. You better be judging the people your kids are hanging around with. Yeah, yeah. I tell you that. You better be judging some things. Uh, listen, this idea that don't judge me, I don't know where they're getting that from. But again, they're taking things out of context. Uh, but do you have knowledge? Do you have discernment? And it says, do you have uh, temperance? Do you have temperance, sir? And then... Uh, and, and it's, uh, that's self-control. Okay? Do you have self-control? Are you able to, uh, you know, has something got control over you or do you have self-control over you? Now, that's tough. That's tough. That's tough, isn't it? Because uh, things that get, get control of us. Uh, listen, man, our phones can get control of us. Anybody not understand about that? Somebody say amen. amen. Somebody say amen. The TV. Uh, do you have temperance when it comes to TV? Uh, do you have temperance even when it comes to it? not necessarily sinful things, but just uh, how much time are you spending with something uh, and is it bringing you closer to God and has it got control over you or have you got control over it? Temperance. Well, this is a tough list Peter's given him saying, how you doing? I don't want to tell you how I'm doing. Um, temperance. Oh my goodness, what's this next one? I just want to skip this one. Patience. Amen. Let's just skip that one because I ain't got none of it. Patience. Do you have patience? I mean, you know, we live in a... I mean, gee whiz, man. What would we do without microwaves? And fast food and Amazon one-day delivery. And, man, we'd go crazy, wouldn't we? Do you have patience? Godliness. That's speaking of holiness. Be holy. Brotherly kindness. Do we have that in our lives? Are we kind to other people? And do we have love? Do we have charity? Does that love move us to action? Again, James talks about that. James says, listen, faith without works is dead. Even James learned that. And then we get to that verse 8 where it says abounding. We've been talking about that growth there. But notice what it says here. It says, uh, you shall neither be barren or unfruitful. Are you fruitful? I like what Adrian Rogers said about fruitful. He said, uh, he said this about being fruitful. He said, here's what fruitful is in your life. Uh, do people love Jesus more because of you? That's an, if you're fruitful. Are you fruitful? Adrian Rogers is good. I like stealing his stuff. Amen. I don't think he'd mind. But I tell you, uh, do people love Jesus more because of you? Are you fruitful? in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you're not, you're blind. You're blind, you can't see. You have no vision, you can't see far off. That means you have no vision. And you've forgotten that He was purged and you were purged from your old sins. Now notice what He says. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Now listen, He's not saying that God has to make your calling and election sure. This is not a Godward command. This is a manward command. In other words, he says, listen, God knows you're saved if you say. He's not doubting it. He's not doubting his blood, his covenant. Uh, but you know, as Christians, listen, let me tell you something. You know when doubt will come into your mind? When you're not living godly and when you're in disobedience. Uh, boy, the devil knows that, man, and the demons know that, and they'll begin to work on your confidence. And he's saying, listen, if you want to make, uh, if you want to have the sureness of your salvation, the sureness of your salvation, you use this checklist in your life to see where you're at. Because listen, uh, when you're doing these things, you're partaking of the divine nature. 
You're, uh, you're allocating God. You're becoming fully acquainted with Him. And listen, listen, when, when Jesus is right here with me, and He's always here because He's indwelling me, but I'm talking on a practical sense, okay? When, he's, when we're close, listen, I don't doubt that He's working in my life. Why? Because I can see Him. He's right here walking with me. Yeah. Boy, when I'm at distance from Him, though, and I can't find Him nowhere, boy, that's panic time, isn't it? That's panic time. You ever lost your parents when you was little in the school? Or vice versa, you ever lost kids? And don't tell me I don't want to tell you bad parents. <laughs> lost kids. Well, it's panic time. You can't see them, ain't it? Amen. Panic time. It's panic time. How you, how you doing on that checklist? I want you to take your paper, put your name on it, and pass them up front. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to check your checklist out. I'm going to check it for you. And I'll give you the results Wednesday publicly on the one call. <laughs> Friends, we need to have this. Yes. We need to be students of God's Word and have that super knowledge that knows that we're acquainted with Him intimately yes. in a deep, meaningful way. Are you growing in the Lord? Have you got virtue, temperance, patience, Brotherly kindness, charity, discernment are these things in your life. I hope they are because you need them to have that confidence to go forward for Him. Let's stand and pray. I thought I had about 10 minute message tonight. Good. And I just about went over. Praise His holy name. I still got some in the tank. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for these folks, Lord, faithful few. God, I hope I've encouraged them. Lord, Father, you've encouraged me, uh, God, by just showing me uh, where I'm lacking, Lord, Father, uh, in my walk with you, Lord, Father. And I want to have that intimate knowledge of your word, Lord, and of you. And I want to partake more of the divine nature, God, through the precious, precious promises that you've given me, Lord. And I just pray for these folks, Lord. I pray you touch them this week. I just thank you for their giving heart, their willingness. Lord, Father, to be faithful to you, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord, Father, for the, uh, the other sheep that are out there, Lord, Father, in our community, Lord. Thank you for bringing in so many folks, Lord, Father. And we're so thankful. And we just want you to just uh, touch people's hearts, Lord, and, and grow us uh, in spirit and truth, Lord, Father. And so we just praise your holy name for what you're doing. And we just ask it all uh, in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.